Hello, everybody. I had a little technical difficulty right at the beginning because uh, Facebook has changed the interface. Uh, so I need to flip over here real quick and see if I'm on. I believe that. Yeah, okay, I'm on. I see that people are on. Welcome, everybody, to Rightly Dividing the Word with R.K. Brown. Um, before I get started, I kind of want to kind of let you get into my head a little bit. Um, I've been this week listening to a lot of jazz because I love jazz and, uh, you know, it's just always been in my playing, even though I'm not a jazz musician, jazz is in my playing. And, uh, so this week I've been turned on to, well, a couple of weeks ago, I got turned on to a guy named Aydin Essen, who is a Turkish jazz pianist who, if you haven't heard him in, if you like jazz, the guy is off the chain, right? So... I have a friend in Atlanta, and I hope he doesn't mind me mentioning his name if he uh, is happens to be tuned in here. His name is Buzz. And we played with Curtis Mayfield together back in 1990, and even before that in the 80s we played in a, in a fusion slash pop dance band <laughs> together. Uh, you know, we did everything from, I don't know, Jeff Lorber fusion to, uh, you know, Jeffrey Osborne. And anyway, so I sent Buzz, or I posted on Facebook, some Iden Essen improvisation. And Buzz hit me back and said, man, I don't hear any space. I was bored, you know, a couple of minutes into it. And uh, let me hear a ballad. So I sent him a ballad, and he said, man, I'm just not feeling it, you know. And so, you know, I hit back and said, I dig. But then I came to kind of an epiphany about myself. And that epiphany is that I think that I am somewhat of a technical guy you know I've always talked about those musicians that come from Berkeley and they can't really play music with others they can play an instrument really well but they can't really play music with others now I'm not like that because I've always played music with others ever since I was I've been on the road since I was 16 years old so I'm not like that but I do like a technical approach to things like music and I kind of had to come to an epiphany with myself this week I'm a very emotional musician but I came to the conclusion that I'm also a, I think technically, like the way I play with drums is super tight, whether it be country music or whatever it is, I play with drums very tight and I'm very technical. Now, the reason I said that is because this message this week is somewhat of a technical message. It's not really a, uh, I'm going to flip over and make sure I'm still on. Uh, it's not, yeah, okay, I'm on. Welcome, everybody. Uh, it's It's not a feeling message so much as it's a technical message. And I think that's kind of the way a lot of my messages are because that's just how God made me, I guess. And so I kind of had to come to terms with it this week. So thank you, Buzz, for helping me to come to terms with something that's always been there that I guess I haven't really given as much thought as I should about it. So anyway, uh, having said that, I got in a conversation last week with another friend who ask the question. I was talking about the scriptures and the accuracy and the infallibility of the scripture, kind of like that, and how that we are to go by the scripture always, and only the scripture always, and I believe that to be true. And this person said, well, then why do we have the Holy Spirit? And so the title of this message is, Why Was the Holy Ghost Given? And the Holy Ghost was given for a lot of reasons that I'm going to talk about tonight. And uh, I'm going to talk about some reasons that the Holy Ghost was not given that people, especially in modern Christianity, uh, practice all the time. So before I get down to the message, I would like to invite you to come worship with us at Fatherland Baptist Church in Madison, Tennessee. And if you, uh, if you don't live close enough to do that, or if you're just not so inclined to come to Madison, Tennessee, or to come to our church and worship with us, then find yourself a Bible-believing church if you're not already in one and get in it, and preferably one that reads out of a King James Bible. I've talked many times about that. I won't go deep into it, but you should find a church that reads out of the King James Bible because the book, that is the right book for English. Now, I'm going to give you some scripture to exhort you to be in fellowship with other believers and also under the authority of a pastor. Not just, like a lot of people will say when you talk about, you know, that you shouldn't forsake the assembling of others, people will say, well, you know, the Bible says, Jesus said, where two or more are gathered together in my name, I'm there among them. And so that's church. Well, not really. It is true that Jesus is among the believers. However, the Bible 
tells us in lots of places about pastors that we need to be under the authority of a pastor, like Hebrews 13, I think maybe verse 7, but I'm not sure about that. But it's definitely Hebrews 13, to give account to those that bear rule over you, because as if those that had to answer to God for your souls, that the pastor actually has to answer to God for his congregation. So you need to be under the authority of a pastor. Anyway, I'm going to give some scripture. I'm going to move on into the lesson. I've babbled long enough. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. Don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Now, we go a little deeper, and we see in Ephesians 4.11 where it says, He gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So the pastors and teachers are given, and the evangelists are given. Now, of course, we don't have prophets and we don't have apostles anymore, and I'm going to go into that. You, you'll actually see why I say that in a minute. Some of you right now are going, oh, he said we don't have prophets anymore. That is correct. We don't have prophets, not in the way we had in the Old Testament. Now, I am prophet. I will be prophesying to you tonight because I will be reading out of the Word of God, and I will be saying, thus saith the Lord, because if it's in the Bible, then it is thus saith the Lord, and that is the technical definition of prophesying. Prophesying does not always mean to tell the future because a lot of times in the Old Testament, God would say through the prophets, like, for instance, through the prophet uh, Nathan, when Nathan told the little story to David after David had committed sin with Bathsheba and had her husband murdered, the prophet Nathan goes to David and he tells him this little parable and then he says, you are the man. I know what you did and God knows what you did. So to prophesy is to say, thus saith the Lord. And that's what I'm going to be doing with scripture tonight. So the, the evangelist and the pastor and teacher are given for the perfecting of the saints, for the ministry, for the work of God, to teach you how to, to, teach you to, to, how to walk in fellowship with Christ, and we're going to talk about that a little bit, to minister to the other saints, to do the work of God, because we are all supposed to be working for God. We're all supposed to be ministers of God. This, what I'm doing right here, is ministering to the saints, I hope. You know, we've let's see if, yeah, we've got some people on here, and I'm guaranteeing that some of the people on here are believers. So, having said that, I'm moving on. I had something I wanted to say, but I think it left my mind, so I'll go to prayer cam, and if it comes back to me, then I'll say it. Sometimes I just get down a rabbit trail so far that I, I forget where I'm at. So, I'll go to prayer cam. And we'll get on with the lesson. Father God, tonight I will be talking about your precious Holy Spirit. And I want to be real careful not to say anything wrong. Not to... I'm not going to blaspheme your Holy Spirit, Lord, because I'm not going to speak evil of your Holy Spirit. And... I just want to teach this message right, Lord. I know that I'm technical... To some degree, you know, I'm not going into, you know, works of theologians and commentaries and stuff like that, but I am technical with the Bible. And, Father, I just want your help to convey this message to people who aren't necessarily technical, who just love you or who will come to you as a result of hearing this message. I just want to communicate your word right correctly to them in a way that they can receive it because everybody's different lord you deal with everybody differently even though the scripture says that no prophecy of scripture is, is of any private interpretation which i'm going to deal with that i believe that lord but nevertheless everybody is different so please lord help me to reach out to a wide variety of thought processes and opinions and feelings and communicate your word to people in a way that glorifies Jesus Christ because, after all, that is 
the thing that the Holy Spirit is all about. That and nothing else. The Holy Spirit is about glorifying the name of Jesus Christ. So I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay. Wow. Going to start into this message now. I just kind of, I think the Spirit is moving. I, I hope the Lord is moving on this because this is really important. I'm going to start out in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in times in time past to the fathers by the prophets, hath now in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. So, It says that he has or hath spoken to us. So that is past tense, at least in the English. I don't know what it looks like in the Hebrew, but at least in the English, he has spoken to us. In time past, he spoke to us through the prophets, which is what I talked about a little bit earlier, that in the Old Testament, God spoke to us through the prophets, spoke and, and actually still speaking to us through the prophets because of their writings. But he spoke directly to the people through the prophets, but now has past tense, in these last days, spoken to us through his Son, Jesus Christ. Now, the way he has done that is through the Bible. I have, when I was a young charismatic, I was taught to think like this because I was in the charismatic movement for a couple of years. I was taught to think that God was talking to me. And I have come to sort of, uh, I'm adjusting my camera here, as you can tell. I have come to uh, not accept that. I've come to believe that God speaks to us through the Scripture and makes the Scripture living by the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to show you how that works later in the in the text. But I do not believe that the Holy Ghost is talking to people in their ear like He did with Samuel. I believe that the Holy Ghost is talking to people through the Bible because if you're an unbeliever, you can read the Bible and it won't make any sense to you. But my uh, the mother of my dearly departed wife, Wanda, who died almost three years ago, her mother just passed away last Sunday, a week ago, today. And her mother was, I would definitely say, of pretty, and I don't mean this in any disrespectful way, it's just the truth, she was a person of not high intelligence. But yet she read through the Bible every year. She had some cassette tapes that she read along with, and she read the King James Bible, and she had some understanding of it, the King James Bible, because God helped her because she loved the Lord. She's with him now because she loved him. I would talk to her about Bible things, and she would just rejoice, and she would say to my wife, Wanda, she'd say, you listen to him. He knows what he's talking about. She loved talking about the Scriptures. She didn't have real deep understanding of it, but she did have some understanding of it because God worked with her. You can take a very intelligent person and they can read the Bible and not understand it because God is not working with them because they're not born again. If you're born again, God will work with you and help you to understand the Scriptures. Now I'm going to go a little deeper into that concept before I actually start describing the Holy Ghost. All right? Uh, this is Peter talking about the thing that happened with him and James, John, and Andrew, or maybe James and John, at something called the Mount of Transfiguration. And listen to this very closely. Listen to what Peter says. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we may known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. So right there, Peter is saying we heard the voice of God. We saw Jesus shine. He just glowed with the glory of God and we saw it. And we heard the voice that said, this is my beloved son, hear him. Now check out what he says. 
when we heard him on the Holy Mount, right? Okay, verse 19. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, which of course is Jesus. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake. Boy, that just leads me right into my next thing. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So, the Apostle Peter said that we were with Jesus at the Mount of Transfiguration, and we saw him shine with the glory of God, and we saw him talking with Moses and Elijah. They were there talking to him. And yet, in verse 19, he said, but we have a more sure word of prophecy that you do well to take heed to. Again, I read to you, we have also a more sure word of prophecy whereunto you do well that you take heed. He is saying that the word of God written down, because by that time the prophets were long dead, centuries dead, Samuel and Elijah and Elisha and Isaiah and Jeremiah and all those prophets, Daniel and all those were hundreds of years gone. In the case of Samuel, like a thousand years gone. So, he said, we have a more sure word of prophecy. The words that are written down in the Bible, the Bible at that time, which was the, the Old Testament, was already collated and in the same order that we have it now. It was called the Septuagint. About 300 years before Christ, 70 scholars got together and translated the, the Old Testament into Greek and through the Greek koine, which is common, which we're going to see that word here in a little bit the Greek koine, and um, they, they collated the books of the Bible then, and, and at least we know that as far back as like maybe 300 years before Christ, the order of the Old Testament was already set because the Septuagint is in the same order that we have our Old Testament Hebrew Bible now. That's in our King James Bibles, for instance, or in our, in our modern Bibles. And... Um, so Peter is saying that we have a more sure word of prophecy. The Bible is more sure than even what we saw with our eyes. Or even, I will say to you modern Christians now, what we hear or what we think we hear in our ears when we think the Holy Ghost has said something to us. And I'm going to say something right now and take this to heart. The Holy Ghost is not your personal conduit to God so that God can talk to you about personal things. The Holy Ghost makes it his full and only business to glorify Jesus Christ. That is what he's about. He's not about your personal things unless your personal things have to do with the glory of Jesus Christ or if he's dealing with your sin. Yes, God cares about us. He cares about the things that go on in our lives. But the Holy Ghost's job, as I'm going to show well tonight, is to deal with with Jesus Christ, to make Jesus Christ known to us, to give us the revelation of Jesus Christ. Okay, I hope I have made that clear. So God spoke to us in time past by the prophets, but now in these last days has spoken to us through his son, and he's done all that to us modern Christians in the Bible. Now, there, was, there, were, there, there were those who lived in those times that lived all that stuff out, but to us, he is speaking to us through the Bible. So why the Holy Ghost? Let's go. John the Baptist said of Jesus, he said, John said, I indeed have baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. And then Jesus in Acts chapter 1 verse 5 says, For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And we know that not many days hence, after that, not many days after that, they were in that upper room in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, and they received 
the Holy Ghost and they begin to speak with tongues. All right, so first of all, before I get too far ahead of myself, we know that the Holy Ghost is a baptism. So I'm going to now give you the definition of baptism. I'm going to give you the Strong's Greek definition of the word, and I'm going to give you the Webster's 1829 definition of the word. And I forgot, I just realized I forgot to look up a the definition of a word that I have never seen before in Webster's definition. But that's cool. We'll, fit, we'll work it out together. All right. The word baptized or baptized comes from the Greek word baptizo. From a derivative, it, it is uh, the Greek word in Strong's, Strong's number 907. And it is uh, from a derivative of 911, oddly enough, of the Greek word 911. To make whelmed, that is fully wet. Used only in the New Testament of ceremonial ablution, which means washing. Especially, technically, of the ordinance of Christian baptism, baptist, baptize, wash. It occurs that the Greek word baptizo occurs exactly 80 times in the original Greek text, which underlines the King James Bible, 80 exact times. Those of you who are in the numbers of the Bible, look, figure out what the number 8 means, and, and that's what that means. It has reference to that. It has significance that way. The... Um, the Webster's 1829 Dictionary, for the word baptize, it says, see baptism, to administer the sacrament of baptism to the Christian. By some denominations of Christians, baptism is performed by plunging, which I totally agree with, or immersing the whole body in water. And if you go back to the very first thing, in the Greek word baptizo, it says to make whelmed, that is fully wet. So I believe that uh, those who do full immersion, I believe that is the proper uh, way to baptize. And this is done to none but adults or, you know, I, I would say not to adults. But, you know, in my in my understanding of the scripture, Jesus said, suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not for of such is the kingdom of God. So, you know, obviously children can believe and be baptized as well. Uh, more generally, the ceremony is performed by sprinkling water on the face of a person, uh, whether an infant or an adult, and in the case of an infant, by giving him a name, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, which is called christening. Okay, I, for some reason I thought there was a word there in the, uh, in the Webster definition that was kind of weird, but I guess not. I don't know what I was thinking. Oh, I think it may be in the next definition I'm going to give. Anyway, so John the Baptist and Jesus both said that the disciples would be baptized with the Holy Ghost, that they had been baptized with water and that they would be baptized with the Holy Ghost. And, and the word baptizo means to make completely wet, to make whelmed or completely wet. So we know that baptism is a full inward immersion of the Holy Ghost. Uh, the Bible tells us that we've been made a new creation, created in Christ Jesus under good works and all that kind of stuff, but that we are a new creation. And in Galatians chapter 6, which is a verse that I quote all the time, the Bible says that uh, uh, neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature, a new creature. And as many as walk according to this rule, uh, peace be upon them and upon the Israel of God. So we, when we are baptized with the Holy Ghost, when we believe and we are baptized with the Holy Ghost, we are overwhelmed. We are completely wet with the Holy Ghost, with the living water of God. Uh, as it says in Ephesians 5, we're washed by the water of the Word. As Jesus said, you know, uh, to Peter, I believe in uh, in in uh, Acts chapter 13 when he was washing their feet. And Peter said, oh, no, you're not going to wash my feet. And Jesus said, if I wash not your feet, you have no part with me. And Peter said, oh, not only my feet, but my hands and head also. And Jesus said, whoever is cleansed or whoever is clean need only to wash his feet. And he said, you are clean because of the word. And we know that the word is Jesus is the word, according to John chapter 1 and Acts chapter 17. 
because and, and Acts chapter 14 because we see that the word was made flesh in John chapter 1. We see that uh, Jesus is, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life in John chapter 14. And then in John chapter 17, he says, thy word is truth. So Jesus is the word, he is the truth, and the word is the truth. So Jesus is the truth. And in I believe it's in uh, 2 John, maybe chapter 1. Maybe there's only one chapter to 2 John. Anyway, uh, that John talks about the truth that in you and that is the holy ghost so the holy ghost is the truth jesus is the truth jesus is the word he dwells within us we're baptized with the holy ghost with an inward baptism i hope that makes sense i'm just trying to just drive the point home now what i do not believe that baptism of the holy ghost is is rolling around in the floor and acting all crazy because god is not the author of confusion I do not believe that people are talking in tongues today. I, I will not go so far as to say I believe the gift has been done away with. Maybe it has. I am pretty much a cessationist. But I believe that tongues are earthly languages. I don't believe that they're heavenly languages like people try to say uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14 implies. So I don't believe that the the gifts of the Spirit are working in the same way as they were just as I don't believe there are prophets and I don't believe that there are apostles. I believe that there are evangelists and pastors and teachers for the edification of the saints. I talk about that every week. Now, I am moving on. I've almost forgot where I was here. Oh, yeah. We're moving to the next phase of our teaching, which is power and the gospel. Check this out. We know that the Holy Ghost is a baptism. So what is this baptism for? But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Jesus says in Acts chapter 8, like three verses down from that last verse I gave you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So the power is going to cause them to be a witness for Christ, right? Y'all see that clearly? That ye shall receive power and ye shall be witnesses to me both in Jerusalem and Judea and in Samaria and all the four corners of the earth. So you are given power to be my witness. Now check this out. Let's go a little deeper. The Apostle Paul in Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now how do I know that this power that Jesus is giving them when they receive power in Acts chapter 1 that he's saying, which actually happened in Acts chapter 2, how do I know that this is the same power? Well, the way I know is that they both use the same Greek word, and that word is dunamis, and that is where we get our word dynamite. And the definition, it is Strong's Greek uh, word number 1410, and it is force, literally or figuratively, specifically miraculous power, usually by... Implication, a miracle itself, ability, abundance, meaning, might, mightily, mighty deed, worker of miracle or miracles, power, strength, violence, mighty, wonderful work. It occurs 120 times in the King James Bible exactly, not 121, not 123, 120 times, which is 10 times the number 12, which is completion. The word the word uh, number 12 is completion, or is it, per no, 7 is perfection. 12 is completion. So the gospel is the completion of the work of God. And it's interesting that he uses that word violence there in the definition of the word dunamis because uh, it makes me think about that word, that, that verse where Jesus says, uh, since John the Baptist, the kingdom of God suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. So they are going with the power of God. Now, we see that the Holy Ghost is a baptism to wash us inwardly from our iniquity and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, that we are washed by the water of the Word in, in Ephesians chapter 5. And now we see that the Holy Ghost is power that is given to us. And the power is the gospel. So the gospel is given. So now I'm going to show you a bunch of verses, not necessarily in order. In fact, definitely not in order. 
of not in biblical order anyway, not, you know, from, you know, Luke to John to Acts to Romans to so and so. They're in not order, but it doesn't matter because they basically say the same thing. So I'm going to give you about five examples of what this power does. This power that is the gospel. I'm going to give you about five examples of what it does. In Acts chapter 7, we learn about the first martyr of the church who is a deacon named Stephen who was full of the Holy Ghost. And he is about to be stoned to death and he is teaching them Basically, he's kind of going through a, he's, he's doing the, uh, a, what do they call it? The uh, skipping, like skipping of rocks over the, over the Old Testament. He just kind of threw a rock and it's kind of skipping over parts of the Old Testament. So he is, he has told them and then he, he just jumps on them and wears them out and he calls them uncircumcised of heart and mind that you do always resist the Holy Ghost and then they are stoning him to death. And while he's being stoned, this happens. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, remember that they are given power and that they're going to be witnesses for Jesus? Well, he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. So now the Holy Ghost has caused him to open his mouth. Check out this next verse. In Acts 4, 8, Peter and John had healed a man who was lame in his feet from, I guess, for a really long time, like 38 years or something like that. They healed him by the word of God. And then the Pharisees called them in to question them about this. And so that's the scene. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said, so we see again the Holy Ghost is causing him to open up his mouth. You rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to this impotent man by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all. And to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. So we see that not only has the Holy Ghost caused him to open his mouth and speak, but the Holy Ghost immediately turns the attention on to Jesus. In Acts 4.31 after Peter goes back and tells a lot of the other disciples about what had happened with them in the in the temple after healing this man, he goes back and talks to them and they pray, and this happens. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. Now, we see again, that they were filled with the Holy Ghost and spake, right? Okay, now we go to Luke chapter 1 and the father of John the Baptist, whose name is Zacharias. He is a priest, and, and the priest, they, they, they were divided up into their courses because David had set that up a long time ago in, I think, maybe First Chronicles 24, something like that. They were divided up into their courses, so every course once a month would go into the temple and do their service. And so he was of the course of a, a man named Abiah, who was one of the sons of Aaron, or one, you know, one in the tribe of Levi, one of the descendants of Aaron. And he was going in to do his temple service as a high priest. And so when he goes in, he sees an angel, and he's troubled, and the angel gives him this message. And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled because if they saw, if they did their temple service wrong, then God would break out and kill them. So he, he, he saw that angel. He probably thought he was fixing to go be killed. So he was afraid. Fear fell on him. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. We're talking about John the Baptist here. 
thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. And it came to pass that when, oh, uh, let's see, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost from his womb. Okay, so the point I wanted to make there is John the Baptist obviously spoke about Jesus. That's one of the first verses. Actually, that's like the third verse I showed you that John said about Jesus, that there comes one after me whose shoes I'm not worthy to loose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. So John, his whole mission was to speak about Jesus, and he was filled with the Holy Ghost from his womb. So then we see also in Luke chapter 1 when his wife, when Mary, who was already impregnated with Jesus by the Holy Ghost, comes to see Elizabeth, her cousin, who is the mother of John the Baptist. This is what happens. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, when Mary got to the house and said, Hey, it's me, Mary. Hey, cousin. The babe leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost, and she spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And so we go to the next verse. Sorry, y'all keep catching me removing my magnifying glass. I don't know for those of y'all who don't know me who who may just have stumbled onto this. I'm, I'm legally blind. I'm visually impaired. I've got my text real big on the screen, but I still have to use this magnifying glass to see it. So if you see me doing this, that's that's the deal if you catch me. So that's the deal. I don't like for you to see it. I like for it to be hid behind the scripture, but sometimes it just don't work that way. So anyway, so we see that Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost and she began to speak and magnify the Lord. And then, of course, the same thing happened to Mary. And she spake and magnified the Lord in what the, uh, what the theologians call the Magnificat or Mary's praising of God because he counted her worthy to be the mother of Jesus Christ. All right, we're moving on to Acts 13. I think this will kind of speak for itself. Paul and Barnabas, his friend, are preaching. And when they had gone through the isle of Paphos and found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus, which means son of Jesus. That is my commentary, which means the son of Jesus, which was the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man who called for Barnabas and Saul, who was later called Paul, and desired to hear the word of God. But Elimus, the sorcerer, for so is his name being interpreted, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him and said, there it is again, set his eyes on him and said, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him and said, and this is what he said, O full of subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, will thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some, to lead him by the hand. Oh, dang it. Oh. And then we go to Ephesians 5.17, the same kind of thing. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is, and be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And what happens when you're filled with the Spirit? Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we have seen in all these scriptures, all these five passages that I have given you, that when somebody has the Holy Ghost, they open their mouth and speak. And even Jesus even said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So, 
It is pretty clear, it is pretty evident that when somebody has the Holy Ghost, they open their mouth and they speak about Jesus Christ because the Holy Ghost is all about glorifying the name of Jesus Christ. He's not about telling you about new cars and things that are earthly. The Holy Ghost's business is about glorifying the name of Jesus Christ. Okay, I'm going to move on now to Jesus' description of the Holy Ghost in John chapter 14, 15, and 16. I remember there was a time back when I was a charismatic where I read these chapters just over and over and over again, and I still these chapters have a special place in my heart. I understand them a lot better now than I did then, but they really have a special place in my heart. And uh, by the way, get a Bible right now and turn to Acts chapter 1 and make a mark there and go back and read it later about the qualifications of an apostle. There were qualifications for somebody. The reason I say that there are no apostles now it's clear that in the first verse I gave you in, in Hebrews chapter 1 that there, that there are no prophets now because that in, in different ways in time past God spoke to us through the prophets. But now in these last days have spoken to us through his son. So we see that there are no prophets there. But if you go to Acts chapter 1, you can see the qualifications of an apostle. So I believe that there can't be any apostles because they had to actually be with Jesus. The apostle Paul Actually, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, said he was born as of one born out of due time. So go to Acts chapter 1 and 1 Corinthians 15, and you will see what I'm talking about. All right? Just wanted to put that out there in case those of you, in case there are those out there who are going, man, this guy's crazy. There, There's an apostle down at the church that I go to. No, there's not. If he calls himself an apostle, he's a liar because there are no apostles. There cannot be any apostles. The apostle Paul said he was one called out of due time, and he was the last to see Christ. And an apostle had to be somebody that saw Christ. When Kenneth Copeland and Charles Capps and Kenneth Hagin and all those guys say that they saw God, they saw Jesus, they are liars. If Benny Hinn says he saw Jesus, he is a liar. Go to Acts chapter 1 and you will see clearly that that's the case. All right, moving on. Here's Jesus' description of the Holy Spirit in four verses or four uh, four keyboard positions, so probably a lot more verses than four, but four keyboard positions I've got. So four frames, four slides, okay? Whatever. <laughs> oh, man, that's that technical part of me coming out, right? Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 15, If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, and you know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. If that's not a Trinity verse, there's no such thing as a Trinity verse. He calls it the Spirit of truth for one thing, and we know that Jesus is the truth. So he's the Spirit of Jesus. And uh, the Word is truth, so he's the Spirit of the Word. Because if they equal the same thing, then they equal each other, right? But then Jesus says that uh, even the spirit of truth whom the, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you. Jesus is talking about himself there. For he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. So Jesus comes to us. By way of the Holy Spirit. So, you know, when, when some Baptist preacher tells a little kid, come and ask Jesus to live in your heart. Well, that's essentially what he's trying to tell him. Although the Bible doesn't tell us to ask Jesus to come live in our heart. The Bible tells us to believe the gospel. i got to stop and have some water. <clears throat> I about spoke myself dry. Mm. about spoke my throat dry here. Mm. Anyway, uh... Back to the scripture. <clears throat> In verse 25, These things have I spoken to you, being yet present with you, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I said unto you. So now we see that the Holy Ghost is called the Comforter. And like, for instance, we see in uh, was it First Thessalonians, 
4, starting at about verse 13, where the Apostle Paul is talking about the coming of our Lord Jesus and the sounding of the last trump and all that kind of stuff and the dead in Christ being raised first, and then we which are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds, and we shall forever be with the Lord. And he says, comfort one another with these words. Well, if Jesus is the truth and the Holy Ghost is the spirit of the truth, and if Jesus is the word, and Jesus and the Holy Ghost is the comforter, and the Apostle Paul tells us to comfort one another with these words. We're talking about the same thing. We're talking about the Spirit of God moving to comfort through the Bible the believers. All right? Moving on. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, there we go again, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me, and ye also shall bear witness, because ye have been with me from the beginning. Right, so he's uh, sorry, I had to go back and look at that again just to see, just to double do a double take on what I just read. So he said, he will, the Spirit will testify of me, Jesus saying about himself, and then he says, you will be witnesses. Well, remember that verse I gave you, uh, that you will receive power and be witnesses unto me? Let's go there. I think I can get there pretty easy. Back at Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses of me, both in Jerusalem and Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And then, of course, the Apostle Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So now he, they're going to be witnesses of Jesus because the Comforter, which is the Spirit of Truth, is come. Right? And because they have been with him from the beginning. So they were apostles. Remember what I said about the gifts of an apostle, about the requirements of an apostle? That they have been with him from the beginning. So he was talking about them particularly, but that extends to us because in Acts chapter 2, at the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, the apostle Peter said that this gift is for you and for your children and for your children's children and everyone afar off, even whomsoever our Lord will call. Acts 2.38 and 2.39. So now... We see once again that the Comforter is the Spirit of Truth, and the Spirit of Truth is going to make them witnesses and us witnesses. So once again, we're opening our mouth. The Spirit of God is causing us to open our mouth, right? It's the same kind of thing that I've been talking about all along. But now, I, and this is in John chapter 16, but now I go to my Father. I'm sorry. Let me start over. But now, I'm sorry, sometimes, sometimes I just read it in my head. It's like, uh, because I guess because I'm visually impaired, sometimes I just get inside my head and I don't actually read the words that are in front of me. And I, you know, I need to repent of that and really quit doing it. Sometimes when I'm playing music with a chart, I do that same thing. I play what I hear around me instead of playing the paper. And then that gets me in trouble sometimes. But anyway. But now I go my way to him that sent me and none of you asketh me, where the goest thou? But because I have said these things unto you, sorrow hath filled your hearts. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter, there it is again, will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. So when the Comforter comes... He's going to reprove the world. He's going to comfort the believers. He's going to sometimes rebuke us and chastise us, but he's going to comfort the believers in Jesus Christ that even when you're chastised, you know that God is not going to throw you away, and there is some comfort in that. Even though chastisement is not good, there is still comfort in knowing that we are the sons of God and God is not going to throw us away. But when the comforter comes, he will reprove the world of sin, of judgment, and of righteousness. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Remember he said, talking about the Holy Ghost earlier, he said, whom the world cannot receive, because they don't believe on Jesus Christ. 
And until they hear the gospel, they will never believe on Jesus Christ. The Ro in Romans chapter 3, there says, There's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that seeketh after God. There's nobody seeking after God. God in X in John chapter 4 says, Jesus said to the woman at the well that God seeks after those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. So it's God that actually does the seeking. There's none that seeketh after God, right? So he's going to reprove the world of sin because they do not believe on him. So he's going to reprove them. He's going to cut them in their hearts and some will believe. Of righteousness because I go to my father and ye see me no more. Because Jesus is righteous and he goes to his father and we see him no more. And actually we're not going to see him personally until we are have left this body and are gone on to heaven to see him. Hold on one second. Son, you can walk on through if you want to. My son just walked in the door. So I'll go to the scripture and you can walk on through, son, of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. I let him get up the stairs. I don't think he wanted to be on camera. Of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. And in Matthew 25, it makes me think about Matthew 25 where Jesus talked about those who didn't minister unto his brethren who were down and out, who were sick and who were in prison and who were naked and all that stuff that they didn't minister to him. He said, depart you that work iniquity unto everlasting punishment reserved for the devil and his angels. So not only is the prince of this world judged, but those who serve him. And let me say this right now. If you do not serve Jesus Christ, by default, you serve the devil. You are a devil worshiper. I don't know any other way to say it. I'm going to look you look in my eyes as I say this because I'm behind a camera and you can't hit me with a rock. But you can if you see me out on the street. So, you know, there is that. If you do not serve Jesus, you serve the devil. You know, there, there was a time when Bob Dylan actually had a Christian album. And, uh, you know, I don't think that Bob Dylan is a Christian. I, I don't think that at all. In fact, I saw an interview with, with him and Bill Moyers where he said that he was, you know, serving out his contract with the devil, essentially, that he had made a deal with the devil and he was doing his part. So, <clears throat> but he had a Christian album, and in that Christian album, he said things like, uh, you might be an ambassador from England or France. You might like to gamble. You might like to dance. You might be the heavyweight champion of the world. You might be a socialite with a long string of pearls, but you're going to have to serve somebody. Yeah, you're going to have to serve somebody. It might be the devil. Or it might be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. And that is true. What Bob Dylan said there when he was for a minute making a profession of faith in Jesus Christ, what he said is true. It might be the devil or it might be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. Jesus put it like this. Whoever is not for me is against me. Whoever, whoever does not gather with me scatters. And that word scatter in the Greek is the word synagogueo. It means like synagogue or, or a gathering place. If we don't gather with Jesus, we scatter. Whoever is not for Jesus is against Jesus. There is no neutral position. Let me see where I left off. Okay. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot hear them now. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, there it is again, the spirit of truth, and Jesus is the truth, so he's the spirit of Christ which he actually is called in Romans chapter 8, verse 9. When the Spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Like the prophecy of the Apostle Paul when he talks about the last trump and you know, Jesus coming and the dead in Christ rising first and then we which are alive and remain. Or, you know, all the, the whole book of Revelation or, you know, all the stuff in the book of Daniel about the end times. All that stuff he, he's showing us through the scriptures. He's showing us things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall make it known unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he shall take of mine and shall make it known to you. But bear this in mind, 
This is real important, right? At verse 13 here. Howbeit, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself. In the charismatic churches, they they just talk about the Holy Ghost all the time, and they never talk about Jesus. They want all the power of the Holy Ghost. But they are denying the power of the Holy Ghost because the power is the gospel. The power is not the miracles and stuff, even though there is a place where the word power, the word dunamis, is used in the place of the word miracle. So certainly there there is a place where the miracles were power, no doubt about it. But the power is the gospel. To pow- the power to save is the gospel. And the Holy Ghost will not speak of himself. So you know that if you go into a church and they're talking about the Holy Ghost and not about Jesus Christ, you know they're in a, you, you know actually that you're in a church where the Holy Ghost is not working in that church because the Holy Ghost always, always, always speaks of Jesus. That is his one and only task. He speaks of Jesus. In everything that he does, he does it so that he can bring to your remembrance Jesus Christ. That is what he is about. Okay? We're moving on. I'm going to another another idea now. I'm going to talk about the fellowship of the Holy Ghost. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communication of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. Remember when I said to you earlier in the in the message, and I know this message is going long, and I'm sorry about that. I hope y'all are still hanging with me. Yep, there's still people hanging with me. I said that uh, the Jewish scholars back about 300 years before Christ uh, translated the Old Testament into the Greek, into the Greek koine. Well, the word koine comes from this word koinonia. It means common. Koinonia. It is uh, 2844 in the Greek uh, Strong's Concordance. It means partnership. That is literally participation or social intercourse, or what is that word? Pecuniary benefication. Uh, I think that probably means peculiar benefit to the believer. Uh, communicate, communication, communicate, let's see, communication, uh, distribution, fellowship. I think probably the strongest word is fellowship. And oddly enough, again, that word appears 20 times, not 21, not 19, 20 times exactly in the Greek New Testament. So in the in the Textus Receptus, I don't know about the, the you know, Nestle's Alon or anything like that, but I know that in the Textus Receptus, it appears 20 times. So um, moving on. Uh, what am I talking about here? Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithy- Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. So now we're talking about sanctification because we are sanctified by the Spirit. And that word sanctification means to be set apart. The word sanctified is has the exact same definition as the word holy. It is the word hagiadzo in the Greek, I believe, uh, if I remember correctly. I didn't look it up, but I think I remember. Hagiadzo, and it means to be separate, separated, holy, sanctified, Right? So now we see that the Holy Ghost separates us from the world. Because what did, what did uh, he say here? Uh, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace be unto you. So we are, uh, didn't mean to press that, we are sanctified unto obedience. Or as it says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 or 11, that we are uh, created in Christ Jesus and predestinated unto good works that we should walk in them, unto good works or obedience, that we should obey Christ. 
That is what the Holy Ghost does when he sanctifies us. He sets us apart, and we begin to obey Christ. And the more you go along with Jesus through the chastening of the Lord and through just the learning of wisdom through the Scriptures, we become sanctified. We become more and more set apart. <clears throat> I need more water. I'm really talking a lot tonight. This is a long lesson. Y'all forgive me. I hope you can hang with this. I actually always <laughs> I always rejoice whenever I stumble onto a video of somebody I want to watch like Mike Hoggard or Steven Anderson or whoever it may be, Paul Washer, one of those guys. When it's a long video, I always rejoice because I like that, but not everybody's wired like me because remember, I'm the, I'm the guy who's wired for technical things kind of, you know. So anyway, uh, the next verse. But we are bound, let's see, it's Second uh, Thessalonians 2.13. But we are bound to give thanks all the way to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. So part of the Christian life is to be sanctified or set apart or made holy by the Spirit. Now, right at the beginning, let me just say this, that right at the beginning of salvation, when we believe, then we are sealed by the Holy Ghost. And I'll go to that right next. And, and so in that sense, we are immediately sanctified. We're set apart from the world and we become children of God, not to be undone. However, our bodies then begin to be sanctified because we begin to put to mortify the deeds of the flesh, as the Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 8, that we are to mortify or put to death the wicked deeds of the flesh. That is sanctification of our bodies, but our spirit is actually sanctified immediately at the new birth. All right, now, having talked about sanctification, let, let me say this. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. So we know that we have been sanctified by the Holy Ghost. We've been set apart by the Holy Ghost and sealed unto the day of redemption, and we are not going to lose our salvation. I do not believe that somebody that is truly born again will lose their salvation. I do believe that there are those who are enlightened, who, even as Hebrew said, has tasted of the good word of God and the powers of the coming age. They have tasted the gospel, but they're not sealed by the Holy Ghost unto the day of redemption, and so they fall away. But that which the seed which fell on good ground are they which, through an honest and sincere heart, bring forth fruit unto righteousness. Some thirtyfold, sixtyfold, some a hundredfold. Different Christians bear different amounts of fruit. Their flesh is sanctified. Everybody is an individual, and God deals with everybody on an individual basis. But they are sanctified by the Holy Ghost, and we, when we step out of mortifying the deeds of the flesh and step into sin as Christians, we grieve the Holy Ghost. And then God begins to chasten us. God chastises those that he loves. Um, Hebrews chapter 12, starting at verse 5, I believe. Go read it. God chastens every everyone he loves. And also, Jesus in uh, uh, Revelation chapter 3 said to the church at Laodicea, As many as I love, I chasten. If he loves us, he chastens us. And uh, so there we are. Now, the last thing is spiritual gifts. Not only has the Lord baptized us in the Holy Ghost, in other words, washed us through and through by the water of the word, made us a new creation, made us a new creation, but he's given us power, and that power is the gospel, and he's caused us with that power to open our mouths, because from the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks, and we open our mouth and we glorify God, because that's what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit comforts us in our trials and tribulations, but he makes us witnesses to Jesus Christ. The Holy Ghost is about glorifying Jesus Christ, so when I come to spiritual gifts, these spiritual gifts are only about one thing, and that is to glorify Jesus Christ. Everything that the Holy Ghost does is to glorify Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul says, uh, oh, wait a minute. I forgot about this. The fruit of the Spirit. We also bear fruit of the Spirit. 
as the Spirit sanctifies us, we bear fruit. And we don't want to grieve the Holy Ghost, but we want to we want to make we want to be pleasing to God through faith by obeying him because we believe him. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law, and they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another, or you might say, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. So bear fruit, follow the Spirit, walk in the Spirit. There is there now there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who walk not according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. So says Romans eight verse one. That boy, I've referred to Romans eight a lot tonight. That's a strong chapter. The book of Romans is strong anyway. Uh, it is said by many a theologian that if you of course understood the gospels, if you understood the gospel message, and you suddenly were trapped on a desert island with one book of the Bible, you would probably want to be. You would probably want that book to be Romans because all the doctrine is in Romans. Now, I personally would say Romans and Hebrews because all the doctrine is definitely in Romans and Hebrews because between them you can understand the Old Covenant and the New Covenant and how they how they work and how that the Old Covenant is done away with but that God has written his laws on our hearts that we should obey him, that we should not grieve the Holy Ghost, but that we should obey him. All right, now we're going to go into spiritual gifts real quick. The Apostle Paul in Romans 1 verse 11 says, For I long to see you, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift, to the end ye may be established. So spiritual gifts establish the believer in Christ Jesus. And then in Romans 12 verse 6 he says, Having then gifts differing according to the grace of God that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. And that is what I'm doing to you right now. As I read those words, I am prophesying. I am saying, thus saith the Lord, because the Bible, I've already showed you where the Scripture said that the prophets of old uh, spake not in time past by their, by their own will, but by the... Uh, hold on, I'm about to do something bad here. Um... Okay, uh, for the prophets of old spake not of their own will. How did he say it? Uh, for the prophets came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So the spiritual gifts are to, oh, there we go, this, this keyboard. I, I have bought this Logitech solar keyboard. It's the worst money I've ever spent. I think it costs about 50 bucks. I don't recommend you buy one, at least not for your Mac. I hate it. I don't know why I don't do away with it, but I, I don't like it. I saw good reviews on it, so I bought it, but I hate it. Anyway, spiritual gifts establish us, and having gifts differing from one another, you know, uh, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, and that's what I'm doing right now. As I said, that's why I went off on that rabbit trail. Or ministry, let us wait. On our ministering, for he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, he that stewardeth, or I'm sorry, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be without dissimulation, abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Come on, keyboard. My keyboard just stopped working here. Let me move it over here a little closer to the... Ah, oh, there we go. It's working again. Let me see if it's... Okay, it's working again. I hate this keyboard. Anyway, so... Um, <clears throat> those are spiritual gifts. Those things that I mentioned. Prophesying, which is saying, Thus saith the Lord. Uh, 
you know, teaching, giving, being merciful. Those are all spiritual gifts. But there are other spiritual gifts that I think are not so much in play anymore because the church is established, but they were used to establish the church. I won't say that they're completely done away with, but I will say that I have never seen them in operation, at least not the not some of the more outward gifts like tongues and things like that. I don't believe in healing. I've seen a lot of false miracles when I was in the charismatic church. Like I remember this one particular time, there was this woman who was in a wheelchair and they, they managed to get her to stand up. They prayed over her and they managed to get her to stand up and, Oh, it's a miracle. Hooray. It's a miracle. And then, you know, the next time I saw her and every time after that, she was in that wheelchair because she was not healed of her infirmity. And I saw a lot of things like that in the charismatic church. And so, I don't really believe that the gift of healing is going on. Like, I don't believe that Benny Hinn is healing anybody. If, let me say this, if Benny Hinn is healing people, then it is by the Holy Ghost because the devil don't heal people. If he is healing people, it would certainly be by the Holy Ghost. I would certainly never say that he casts out devils by the name of Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. I would never blaspheme the Holy Ghost, but I do not believe that he or Kenneth Copeland or any of those other guys are brothers. And the reason I don't is because their understanding of the scripture is just whacked. So having said that, let me move into this last thing, which is spiritual gifts. But the manifestation of the spirit is given to every man to profit withal. And that don't mean to profit in your own personal life. That means to profit in your ministering of the gospel. Because remember, the Holy Ghost's business is to minister the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus said he would not speak of himself, but he would take what is mine and make it known unto you. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge, by the same Spirit, to another faith, by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing, by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another, diverse kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh that one and the selfsame spirit, dividing to every man severely, severally as he pleaseth. Severally means to every individual. So, whatever, if all of those gifts are in play, it doesn't matter whether I believe that they are or not, that really doesn't matter. If all of those gifts are in play, they are in play for one reason and one reason only, and that is to advance the gospel of Christ. I hope that I have made this clear. I know this was kind of a technical message. I just went through a lot of verses to show you what the Holy Ghost does. It's not an emotional message. It's definitely a technical message, but I hope you can understand it. And uh, I think that's it. That is my message. I know it was long, but... Sometimes it just works out that way, and I guess they seem to be getting longer and longer as I seem to be having more and more to say. I thank you for joining me. I'm going to go to prayer cam, and then I'm going to tell you good night. Father God, thank you, thank you for getting me through this. Lord, it happened so many times that as I look at all the verses that I have laid out for everybody to see that I think, how am I going to explain these verses? And always... By your spirit, Lord, I seem to be able to do it. And I thank you for that, Lord. I would hate to sit up here and just stumble all over my tongue trying to explain and not being able to explain. So I thank you, Lord, that you have given me your spirit that I can explain. And uh, I do know, Lord, that I have grieved your Holy Spirit. And I know that we all have grieved your Holy Spirit. Father, work in us, keep that word, your Bible, your word, pressing down upon us. Keep your chastisement coming, Father, that we will turn away from our sin and our grieving of the Holy Ghost, whereby we are sealed unto the day of redemption, and turn us more and more to Christ so that we don't break fellowship with you, Father. Put it in the hearts of those that are Christians to really understand this, Lord, to understand that you have sent your spirit for one reason and one reason only. Of all his workings, 
His workings are for one reason and one reason only, and that is to glorify the name of Jesus Christ. Father, help them to understand. And Father, calls anybody that may not be a believer tonight to hear these words and know that Jesus Christ is their only salvation. There is no other name by which we must be saved than that of Jesus Christ. So, Father, please give help in all these things. Cause them to understand your word. Cause the unbeliever to repent and change their thinking, which is the meaning of repent, and turn to Jesus Christ. And cause those that believe, Father, to have a deeper understanding because of this message. Lord, I give you thanks in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Also, before I get out of here, I want to uh, tell you that I'm going to uh, link a sermon, I think, to to here on Facebook and on YouTube uh, to uh, a J. Vernon McGee sermon that my mom sent me earlier today. And I think it was called something like The Holy Spirit and the Sinful Christian. And it was amazing. It's maybe the best sermon I've ever heard. So I'm going to link it here at some point during the evening, the night, whatever it is. And uh, I hope you'll watch it along with this. It's a lot better than what you just heard, I guarantee you that. So anyway, uh, thank you for joining me on Rightly Dividing the Word with R.K. Brown. I am very blessed that I can come to you every week. I thank God for Facebook Live. And I hope he'll let me continue to use it for a long time. Good night, everybody. God bless you.